as an engineer all the way up to engineering supervisor, principal project engineer, contractor to the U.S. Naval Nuclear Program at GE and all the other names that companies had. He has an engineer's perspective on history for which Amsterdam has long held his interest in not just in trolley lines. He is the co-author of Amsterdam in Arcadia Publishing's postcard history series along with Amsterdam historian Robert von how do you pronounce his name? There you go. So without further ado, Jerry Stoker. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Jerry. And thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Go ahead and sit down while I do this. What you're watching now is just kind of a rotation of some of the odds and ends and some of the trolley stuff that I've thrown together. Just something to watch in the meantime, but we'll get going on the program. But the first thing I'd like to do is take you for a very brief trolley ride. Because maybe some of you never had the experience, so. This is at the Seashore Trolley Museum up in Maine. Well, that was great three years ago. Wasn't it? <laughs> uh -huh. This is only this is only like a minute long, so. Give you a little feel for standing in the motorman's cab and taking a look down the tracks. I just wanted to share that, that's all. So So we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the trolley system in Amsterdam and surrounding area a little bit since it was part of the farm that Johnstown and Gloversville. You sure you can see over here? Okay. The farm that Johnstown and Gloversville system. Uh, but before we get into the specifics of that, just a little bit of background. The first mass urban transit actually began with horse-drawn wagons with omnibus service in the 1820s, and omnibus being Latin for all, the whole public transportation. Shortening of that word to bus, that's where our word bus comes from for transportation. The omnibus service eventually gave way to the horse cars or the street cars lines of the 1930s when they started the pull wagons over fixed rails set in the streets. The advantage of setting the rails in the streets is that most of your streets aren't paved. You got vehicles coming over the streets with animals trying to pull them through the mud and the ruts and everything on the streets. They're not very efficient, but you put a steel wheel on top of a steel rail and all of a sudden that horse can probably pull a wagon with 20 people in it without much trouble anymore. So it's a much more efficient way to transport things. So tracks in the street become a very practical way of moving a large number of people around. So beginning in the 1860s, they start looking at different ways to apply power to this. Steam power and cable systems start to replace the animal power to move things around. And as it says here, this is a San Francisco, they're testing cable cars as early as 1873 uh, as a means to move them around. 
But the first large-scale electrically powered street system in the United States actually began in 1888 in Richmond, Virginia. Well, that was kind of a proof of concept system. Once that system was proved, hey, this actually works, we can actually make this a viable concern. It started to take off all around the country. Why is a trolley car called a trolley car? I mean, when you stop to think about it, where did that come from? Well, trolley car runs on electricity. Electricity can kill you if you're not careful about it. So, I mean, it's one thing to put it on a third rail in the subway because people aren't walking through the tunnel. It's another thing to put a third rail out where people are going to have to step over on the sidewalk. <laughs> so the only thing you can do is you got to put it up in the air where it's away from people. So you got to somehow get that power to the motor in your electric car. They tried batteries. Batteries were awful heavy. It doesn't really work out well to have to carry your power source with you because it makes the car heavier and you need more power to move the source of power that you're trying to move. It's kind of like launching a rocket when you have to carry all the fuel with you in order to make it move. So the best thing you can do is you, uh, you figure out a way to get the power from an overhead wire. Uh, the first cars use small, like, small carts running on wires above them to pick up the power. Well, as this was pulled along on the overhead wire, it looked kind of like a fishing line with a lure being pulled through the water, like you would troll for fish. So the car was trolling for electricity. Well, the word troll kind of got made into troller for, it was trolling for electricity, the troller, and that got corrupted to trout. And eventually the word came to apply to the whole car instead of just the little cart pulling the electricity off the wires up above. So that's how they got to be called trolleys. Now this little cart with the four wheels on it running on two wires, it worked pretty good unless you hit a bump. If you hit a bump, it tended to try to jump off the wires. So that didn't work out too well. They were prone to disengage. And the original troller was replaced in 1885 by a new invention of the trolley pole. Now what the trolley pole did was it put like a pulley on the end of the pole with a groove in it. And instead of running on top of the wires, it ran under the wire and it was spring-loaded to push up against the wire from underneath. Well, that pretty much solved the problem of uh, dewiring, as they would call it. It still happened once in a while. And one of the fellows here in... Uh, actually from Rockton by the name of Austin, who was involved in a number of different things in Amsterdam, but he actually got a patent for a device that uh, became quite popular in the trolley industry, which fit over uh, the trolley wires in areas where they were, they were prone to having the wheels jump off, like where two wires would cross each other and they had to have a connection. Uh, and uh, he, got a, he got a patent for that. Uh, to keep them from, from dewiring themselves. And of course, they were attached with a rope down to the car. And uh, when you went, changed directions with the car, the motor would go out and crank that rope down, pull the trolley pole down on one end of the car, and uncrank it on the other end, and let that pole go up on that end. Mm -hmm. So if it did jump off the wire, the motorman would have to go out and pull on that rope and try to get the pole back under and get the pulley back up on the wire again. Amsterdam Street Railroad. So our first adventure with trolleys here in Amsterdam was the Amsterdam Railway Company, which was organized in 1873 as a horse railroad. They had all of one and a half miles of track, ran over Main Market and Division Street. It took 20, 20 minutes to make a round trip, and it cost six cents. If the only went one way, it was only three cents. <laughs> This is one of the first cars. This is one of their livery barns. The line started down at Walnut Street on Main Street, came up, went up Market Street for a block, then went up Division Street until it got up between Byard and Clinton. They advertised that there, when they first started out, that there were groves at both ends of the line where you could go on a Sunday afternoon for a picnic with the family. 
They had three cars when they started out. In their first year of operation, they had 108,000 riders. So you can see they were, they were tapping into a need here in the city. With the funds from those three and six cent rides in 1874, they built a new house and a barn and a car house between Byron and Division Street here in Amsterdam. And that was a picture of one of the structures you saw in the background on that other picture. But this was EOL, the end of the line, here in 1874. Well, we had some changes coming to our little uh, horse-drawn system here in Amsterdam. They applied for electrification, which was the coming thing. And in July of 1890, they were granted permission to electrify the system. That same month, the group of Amsterdam businessmen, people with the name Samford and Morris and some of the other well-known people here in the city of Amsterdam that started it, sold it to a group of businessmen out of New York City and Philadelphia. <coughs> now, you remember a few years ago, there was the big dot-com boom where all the dot-com companies were getting all kinds of investor funds and people all wanted to jump on the bandwagon for that. Well, electrified rail systems were the dot-com of their day. There was investors, all these people that had money to invest, and big businessmen from the cities were looking to buy up these little uh, railways and these little towns all over the country and electrify them. And this one was ripe for the picking because they just got permission to be electrified. So this is workmen, it says workmen placing the finishing touches on track laying on Division Street branch of the line. Well, didn't we already have track on Division Street? Why are, why are we doing this here now? Well, Electric cars are bigger and heavier with the motors and everything in them than the horse-drawn cars. And the rails that they had originally installed just weren't strong enough to handle the big, heavier electric cars. So they had to replace all the rail that was already laid with heavier rail to handle the heavier cars. So this picture is taken about 1890. That's the Methodist Church on the corner of Pearl Street in the background here. St. Anne's is over here on this side. See how residential that lower portion of Division Street was <coughs> just before you got the market? One of the first things that the company did after they started electrification was to put a branch line up Market Hill. So the system was growing up, up being literal in this case. They're going up the hills now. One thing about Amsterdam is it's all hills. You really can't take a horse-drawn trolley car up the hills very well. They just aren't going to make it. It was bad enough with electric cars getting up the hills of Amsterdam in a lot of cases. But once they electrified, you had a much better chance of getting the cars up the hills in Amsterdam. So you start to see the systems spread out now that it's electrified. It can get up the hills again. The interesting thing about Market Hill is that it was the steepest trolley grade in New York State at 14 percent. That means for every 100 feet you moved horizontally, you moved vertically 14 feet. And there were a lot of trolleys that stalled out trying to get up that hill. If there was any, any problem anywhere in the system, if there was any drop in voltage, uh, there was a good chance you might not see the trolley get up the hill on the first try. By 1891, the start of the year, the system was fully electrified. That means all the poles were up, all the wire was there. They extended the Division Street line all the way up to Henrietta Street from where it used to be the Clinton and Byard in that block. They built the new pavilion car house on the corner. Second floor was a dance floor. That's why they called it the pavilion. And there's the old story in the newspaper that said that the bells of Amsterdam danced while the bells of the trolleys clanged below. <laughs> but they needed a place to store these new electric cars rather than the horse barn where they were keeping the old ones. Notice the street wasn't paved yet either. So now we've gone from the original trackage in green 
We've added the Market Hill running up to Meadow Street. We've also added the additional western track all the way up to Henrietta. In 1893, they extended the western track all the way up to Fort Johnson, with the Fort Johnson extension from the car barn. And we have Aiken Park, a little three-acre park just west of the Fort Johnson, the fort itself there. Now, this is a true trolley park because it was owned by the railroad, by the Amsterdam Street Railroad. And it was a nice place to go, and it was nice. Oh, what a nice thing they've done for the people. They've put a park out there so they have a recreation place. What a nice thing they've done for themselves in terms of creating a reason for people to pay their fares to get out to the park and enjoy themselves and then pay their fares to ride back into the city again. So it was quite common for the railroad companies to all build parks at the end of the line to give people a reason to use the trolleys to get there. And this was quite popular. They had picnics and band concerts and everything there. And this, this is the road right now that if you turn just, just west of the uh, fort and go up that little hill, this is where the park was, right there up on that side of the hill. Aiken, the name was changed to Fort Johnson afterwards. So when I say Aiken, it's interchangeable with Fort Johnson in terms of thinking about where you are. So now we have another uh, shakeup coming in terms of who's, who the owners are for the railroad. And the father of Johnstown and Gloversville has had their eye on this little railroad here in Amsterdam for a while. The father of Johnstown and Gloversville, like I said, started in 1867 and it was a steam railway. But it was familiar with electric operation because it had purchased the uh, Cayadetta, which handled the trolley lines up to Johnstown and Gloversville. But for, for a long time, the front end of Johnstown and Gloversville had wanted to get a connection to Amsterdam because they had their eye on somehow getting connected to Schenectady. They wanted to expand their rail situation. And they actually had two divisions of the, of the FJ and G. They had the steam division and they had the electric division. So between the two of them, they covered pretty much the entire region. <coughs> here. So like it says, eventually they wanted to connect to the electric city, which was just a little further down the valley. But Amsterdam was a stepping stone. So in 1901, they started their expansion here, having purchased the Amsterdam Street Railway. That new car barn, the pavilion that uh, had just been bought or just been built, uh, one of the first things they did was tear that down and replace it with a new car barn. Where the other one was about to here, this one takes up the entire block. It's 100 feet long, about 50 feet wide, and it's a clear span structure. It was built by the American Bridge Company, all iron truss work in there, so there's no supports in the middle of it here anymore. And that was to keep the expanded fleet that they were planning on bringing in. So this is on this is on the corner, on the southeast corner of Henrietta and Division Street. Sixty by hundred, and it was the first of the buildings in that area that the railroad was going to put into Amsterdam. And as it says there, it was destroyed by a fire in '59. Next thing they did was they worked on a long, talked about Rockton extension. They extend the line up to Rockton. That was completed in 1901. They started from the top of Meadow Street, up on top of Market Hill, and they went up to Forest Avenue, the head of Forest Avenue on Lime Street. To get there, they had to cross Bun Creek and Harmon Field. And that's at the bottom of Brookside Avenue, if you're familiar with the area out there. But it's quite a ravine there. Meadow Street drops down pretty steep, and then if you go back up Brookside, you're going back up the hill again. Well, the idea was, why come down the hill and go back up again if we can go across it? So they were able to purchase property from the Morris family, which is the nice home that sits just north of there on Brookside Avenue that Selberts owned. Uh, and they put in the Bun, the Bun Creek trestle 
which cut right across the middle of Harmon Recreation Field here. Uh, FJ and G was a very frugal, I'll say, we won't use the word cheap, uh, railroad, and they never really wanted to throw anything away. So this section of the trestle here was actually the replacement bridge that they took off of above Fonda when they rebuilt this. Now, if you've ever gone to Whipple and Edix for an ice cream cone north of Fonda, you've gone under this bridge on the way up to Salmonsville. That's where this piece of this trestle came from. They brought that down from there and uh, used it for part of it. This section of the bridge here, they actually bought from the Delaware and Hudson as a used bridge and brought it up from Albany. Is there any doubt you can see, Jerry, today? Uh, yeah, we'll get to that later on. There was part of it you can still see. Uh, it was a favorite shortcut for kids from Rockton when they headed to Theodore Roosevelt Wilbur Lynch School to walk across this trestle rather than going down and back up the hill again. The heaviest load up to that time that had ever been moved over the Mohawk Turnpike was moving that section of the bridge from up in Fonda and it took 13 teams of freight horses to bring that down in sections. This is a winter scene showing it across the Bun Creek and uh, recreation field. Up at the top of Brookside, overlooking the city reservoir, where there's now a big water tank and solar panels, um, the FJ and G followed Brookside up and made the corner. The old firehouse up here at the top of the Brookside, top of Lion Street. A little bit of snow underground in this picture. But rather than coming across on that trestle, they had originally proposed, well, why don't we go across the top of the dam? Well, the water board didn't think that was a good idea. They didn't really want trolley cars running across the top of the dam because if there was ever an accident, the trolley went into the reservoir. They didn't want to have to mess with that. So they kind of turned thumbs down on that approach. Uh, the trolley line had also proposed moving farther up, building farther up uh, Market Hill and bringing it across where the uh, ravine was narrower up there with a smaller bridge. And then they were going to extend the trolley line over Van Dyke Avenue and back down Northampton Road and make a, make a northern loop on it. Uh, the city wouldn't give them rights to do that unless they were willing to cut them in for a share of the uh, profits on the ridership of the line. And that kind of killed the whole deal there, which also kind of killed any expansion northern of the whole trolley system, which might have happened otherwise. They kind of shot themselves in the foot there. So the Rockton Extension terminated on Lime Street at the head of Forest Avenue right on the corner where Mohasco uh, corporate offices used to be there across from what's Rockton House parking lot now. And that's just a franchise for trackage beyond that point. In 1901, was held by the Amsterdam and Hegeman Traction Company. We had another company that wanted to build the trolley lines here in Amsterdam, and they had gotten a franchise to build lines in Rockton from the city. So the FJ and G line couldn't go any further. The excavations here were for the Amsterdam and Hegeman trolley lines, and that was the that was as far as the FJ and G line could go, right here. Forest Avenue would be there on your left. So the total Rockton extension at this point, this is Meadow Street over here. Across the creek, up Brookside, <coughs> across Locust, down Lion Street, to the head of Forest, and that was as far as they could go. The Amsterdam and Hageman Traction Company eventually laid about 200 feet of track total on Lion Street, going up the street past where the Crystal Bar eventually would reside. Uh, 
That was as far as they ever got. There was a lot of dealings going on. They tried to partner with the trolley company out of Boston Spa. There was a lot of shenanigans going back and forth. Eventually, the city pulled the franchise. The FGA and GA ripped up the tracks that the Amsterdam and Hageman had put in the road and just built. And that was it. That's how they resolved it. They withdrew the franchise to the other company and uh, gave it to the FGA and GA. November of 1901 also saw the FJ&G get permission to install trackage on West Main Street from Market to Division, which means they created a loop all the way up again, paralleling the line coming in on Division Street. So now they had the ability to run eastbound cars in on Division and westbound cars out on West Main, which gave them kind of a belt line system on that end of the city, made it much more efficient for them. This is a picture of a westbound car heading out West Main Street. This is Division Street joining West Main right here and looking up towards the west end of the city. This is an eastbound car coming in. You can tell it's moving to the east because the trolley pole that's up is the one in the back. This way, this pole is locked down in front. But just look at the wire in here for the trolleys, it's hanging overhead. You can also see there's tracks coming up here on Henrietta. And the car barn would have been right over in here. This is the fire station on the corner. It's still there. The satellite station where Walter Martin was. So now we have added this westbound track here at the same time they put this connector track in here, which allows them access from the West Main track up to the car barn. And they also had storage tracks up here where they could park the cars. They built a large office building right next to the car barn. This is the car barn over here. And you see there's a trolley parked in here on the tracks in between them. This was an office and a storage building. This burned in 73. <clears throat> so you get the feeling that the FJG's poured an awful lot of money into this Amsterdam system here pretty quickly. In the two or three years, they owned it now. On July 30th, 1902, the first trolley made its run to Hageman. <coughs> so they extended the line all the way to Hageman, another two and a half miles. Now, I don't believe that all these people were on this car. <laughs> but it looks like a real photo op for anybody who decided that they wanted to get in the picture here. The first car actually began, got into the village was in December because they didn't have materials enough to get to the last bridge to get it finished. But the Hegeman line itself, they extended from the head of Forest Avenue and just below the bridge on Quisby, at, up at the Rockton Y, this is the bridge in the background here. At the time there was a dam here, but there was a trolley bridge that went across just right in front of the city where Crystal Bar was. Here's a car coming off the trolley bridge. Rockton Y is in the background. It was the first of five bridges on the line. The Rockton Line after it came across that bridge, went up Hewitt Street, skirted along the creek, went on up through the woods here, and then followed up along through where Crescent Park would be, eventually. Yeah. Crossed the creek again and then up through the hamlet of Harrowers. Up at Harrowers, across the creek, or up to get into Harrowers, across the creek, on another bridge, that they recycled for all the Very frugal. Crescent Park opened in 1914. And it was named because the Chuck Denunda forms a crescent up in that area. Now this was not a trolley park. This was privately owned. But the FJ and G certainly benefited very greatly from having all the 
patron patronage traveling to and from the park. This is a postcard showing the station up there, and this is an actual photograph of the trolleys pulling up to the station. Once it left Harrower's, it followed the creek up, Harrower Pond, this was all dammed up for the mills here in Harrower's, went on up. There was another park just before you got into, uh, into Hageman up here called Chuck Dunda Park. It was a smaller recreation park up here. And then it proceeded on up into the village. This was called Harrower's Lake. That was actually their mill pond. This is a shot of the trolley going around that curve. And this is the snow banks, which tended to get rather large up there in the same area as that curve. And I don't think I'd want to be the guy out there with a shovel trying to clear those tracks in the winter. Now the entrance to Chuck the, the Chuck in the park was kind of interesting. The trolley stop was over on the far side of the creek, and this rustic bridge would take you across the Chuck the the creek, and then the park itself was over on this side. At one time it was owned by the Bowlers family, the Bowlers Brewery on West Main Street in Amsterdam that they just tore it out a few months ago. They own this, they own this park up there. Once you got to Hageman, they crossed the creek one more time, just below the village. Ran up alongside the creek, behind the mills. Crossed the creek one more time, going into the village. And then right on Mill Street. And Tom's Tavern is right here. I used taverns for a reference. In Amsterdam, that seems to be the way everybody knows where everything is. Tell them where the tavern is. And this was the anchor mill over here, star mill was over here. But that's as far as the line ever went. This shows the trolley parked across from the waiting room here. This is the last bridge going in. And this was the mill pond for the anchor mill that sat here. This is the anchor mill, and you can just see the tracks sneaking behind the anchor mill here. That's a shot of the mill and the what well, used to be the right of way there. This is the waiting room at Hageman. And that's the end of the line right there. They put the timber across, that's it. End of the line. That's this little store is the waiting room here. Now the story is that they didn't let the trolley go any farther into Hageman because the city fought the village fathers, village fathers, Hamlet fathers, I'm not sure what Hageman was at the time were concerned that the electricity going into the ground from the trolley was going to disrupt the crops and the farm animals. <laughs> My own theory is that the right people didn't get paid in order to let the trolley go farther into the village. But that's my own, my own thoughts on the matter. But it seems funny that you would go through all this to build all the way up to there and then stop after you just barely got into the village. Now, on September 25th, 1902, they finally, for the first time, achieved their goal and connected the Glutton Road, Road Cities by a new line that came through Tribes Hill and Fort Johnson. Tribes Hill had two stations, an upper station up near where the school is now, or where the school was, what was the school in Tribes Hill, and a lower one on Lower Mohawk Drive and down through Fort Johnson. And this is typical of most of the trolley stations in terms of design. They're just little square buildings with a seat where you can sit and wait for the trolley to come by. This one was right in front of the fort. Now there were a couple of interesting features. This new line, right about on the line between Fulton and Montgomery County, was a little area called Sulphur Springs Junction, and that's where the line split off. It broke off of the trolley line that ran from Johnstown down to Fonda. They split it off there, and then it traveled for 11 miles down, came through Tribes Hill and Fort Johnson, and it connected Fort Johnson to the line that had run up to Aiken Park. 
And the regularly scheduled service on that line began a few months later in January of 2003. One of the interesting features on it was coming out of Tribes Hill on Muller Mohawk Drive. Is you'd come out of you come out of the woods on Muller Mohawk Drive and you hit this almost 600 foot viaduct, which carried you across the ravine that used to be there. It was filled in when they built Route 5 uh, on up past Antlers when they built the four lane. They filled it all in. But just right there where Mohawk Drive now comes out was this huge ravine. This is about 72 feet high and almost 600 feet long. And they said this was a spectacular view of the valley when you came flying through there on, on the drive. Once you got down to Fort Johnson, the fort would be right over in here, and Aiken Park is over in here. This is the road that goes up. This is Mohawk Turnpike, or what we know as Route 5. And just as you got past the fort, the road used to cross over and then run up parallel to the uh, New York Central tracks all the way up until you got to Tribes Hill. And if you come down Mohawk Drive today, as you get to the lower end of Tribes Hill, it makes a sharp 90 degree turn to the left and goes out and picks up Route 5. Mm -hmm. If you didn't go, if you didn't make that 90 degree turn, and there's still actually a sign there that says road closed, it goes down the hill. That was the old Route 5. That was the old Mohawk Turnpike. It went down and paralleled the railroad tracks all the way down here to Fort Johnson and then crossed over. These two arches here are the trolley lines. This arch here is actually a railroad siding that goes through there. And this is a vehicle pass for a utility road. And we'll see what that siding road is for in a minute. Nineteen oh three also saw completion of a couple more huge projects that they had on their plate. So you can see I, I like to know just how much money they actually poured into this over the course of those three years. They had they built a double track interurban line from Amsterdam <coughs> to Scotia, which means now you can go all the way from Gloversville to Scotia. <coughs> and once you get to Scotia, that gets you into Schenectady over the you know, Schenectady Railway Company lines. So all of a sudden we start seeing the big interurban cars going through the streets in Amsterdam now. So West Main, Division Street, Main Street, we have the big the big cars, this is what was called the St. Louis car, they came from the St. Louis car company. Anybody want to guess where that company was located? <laughs> Newark? <laughs> <laughs> These cars were capable of doing 60 miles an hour wow. down through the valley. They'd have to slow down when they went through the curve and the rock cut down there by Hoffman's. But uh, other than that, they, uh, they were pretty luxurious. This little oval window back here, stained glass, that was in the bathroom. Wow. They were heated, they had ice water for the passengers, very nicely upholstered. They were uh, very luxurious cars. They weren't success, though. So. Uh, they were at the time, but eventually factors came along, like the automobile that kind of put them out of business. But we'll get to that, too. This is a, this is a later, more modern car. And that, that came right at the end of the game. This is, a, this is a map of the entire system. The red lines are the trolley lines all the way from Mountain Lake above uh, Gloversville, up by Bleaker, all the way down through Gloversville, Johnstown, the line down to Fonda, down through Tribes Hill into Amsterdam, up to Hegeman, all the way down the valley. These are all the stops all the way down the valley, all the way down to Scotia, and then they can make the connection to the Schenectady over the Schenectady Railway. So you can see there was a number of little, and all of these are these little stations, this is Hoffman's, all these little stops all the way down. An awful lot of them are family names because that's, uh, that's where they were located on the property of the families as they went down through here. The other big project that the FJNG 
took on 1903 was a new powerhouse. They just built this double lane track all the way to Schenectady. They need electricity to run this thing. The system has become pretty large, and the original powerhouse on Walnut Street with its couple little generators just isn't cutting it anymore. So they're putting half a million dollars into a brand new coal-fired steam station that's going to be one of the largest ones in New York State when it's done. Not just for trolleys, but one of the largest power stations in New York State. And this, we talked about Mohawk Drive. This is Mohawk Drive coming through here. It was set right down here in this hollow. And this was where this is where it was filled in. This is where the this is where the trolley line came across the ravine here that you saw that bridge for. <coughs> so the powerhouse sat right down in here. Coal fired. How are we gonna get the coal up there? Remember that little Track I told you came up from Fort Johnson under the underpass. They built a siding that came all the way up to the powerhouse. Because what they did is they delivered it at an elevation and brought it in the top of the powerhouse. They could have brought it up to the New York Central tracks, but then it would have been ground level. By bringing it in the top of the powerhouse, they could load it into the hoppers right at the top level of the powerhouse and uh, let a gravity feed down through without having to worry about hoisting it back up once they got it up here. So there was another trestle up here that ran into the top of the powerhouse. This is the powerhouse under construction. As it says, one of the largest in the state. This chimney that's going up here would eventually be 170 feet tall. In 1903, it was one of the tallest chimneys in the United States. This is a postcard of the powerhouse. It was built by John Turner, Amsterdam contractor, who built a lot of the Sanford Mills and a lot of the other prominent buildings in Amsterdam. It produced 13,000 volts of AC power. AC, because AC at high voltage is the best way to transmit power without losses. The trolleys run on DC, so you had to have substations to convert it down to the lower 600 volts DC for the trolleys. So you had three substations, one in Glenville, one in Amsterdam, and one in Gloversville, where you brought the 13,000 volts AC in and converted it down to 600 volts DC. So this is the Amsterdam substation on the corner of Division and Henrietta Street. So it's across the street from the car bar. So now, with the substation there, you got the substation on one corner, you got the car barn on the other corner, and you got the office and storehouse next to the car barn. So you've got three big buildings for the railroad right in a row there. The interesting thing about this is this is the only one of the three substations that additionally provided power to residential use in Amsterdam. And that was one of the key things about all of these electric railroad systems. The people that got involved in them were very often looking beyond the trolley system. Because they saw cars coming and they knew that the trolleys probably weren't going to last forever. Cars were going to take over, but electric power was going to be a big thing. People were going to have electric lights, they were going to have electric appliances, they were going to need electricity. And they got in on the ground floor of the distribution systems for electricity and the generating systems for electricity. Because they had the infrastructure already started for the trolley systems. And when the trolleys went away, a lot of these people that had already gotten in on the ground floor with the generation and distribution systems were all set up to get in on the next big thing, which was the electrical uh, infrastructure. The latest major expansion in the Amsterdam trolley system is uh, 1910. They decided to build a belt line. The Beltline leaves Main Street and Vroman Avenue, climbs Vroman Avenue, another 14% grade. Cuts across, makes its way across the top part over to the Five Corners area. Goes up Forest Avenue. Once it gets up across roughly from where Mohawk Dairy area cuts up, goes through the residential area, gets up to Clisby Avenue, 
and rejoins uh, up where Northern Boulevard is. The area that comes be known, becomes known as the Rockton Y. Now why? Yeah, why? Why? We'll get to why the why in a minute. But why this was built, it had a lot of support from the Rockton Realty Company to build through this area because they're trying to sell all these lots up here for the building of new homes. And this area of the city's just been just starting to be developed up here. The principals of the Rockton Realty Company also happen to be the principals of the McCleary, Wallen, and Krauss rug mills, which are across the street over here. So they're looking to sell all this property to the people that work up here so they can buy property to build homes. And doesn't it drive the property value up if the trolley line happens to run within a block or so of your house? So they're big supporters of building this belt line through here. This belt line was never profitable and never popular. And we'll see later on that when the railroad starts tightening its belt, the belt line is the first to go. The belt line comes in on Clisby Avenue. We've already got the Hegeman line coming in across here, running up Hewitt Street. So when the belt line comes in, they make a connection and they form this triangular shaped arrangement of track. This is where the Rockton Y finally gets its iconic name. Because in railroad parlance, a Y is a triangular arrangement. Because if you come in any of those three points, you can exit out of the other two. Or by going through the other two and then backing around, you can go back the way you came. So you can turn your trolley car around to go back the way you came. So that's a, that's a rock and why. And in this picture, you see cars coming in from three directions. This one came, just came in from Lyon Street. That's, that's the old uh, rock and why market behind it. This one's coming down Hewitt Street. And this one's coming up Clisby Avenue. You can see the bridge that this one just came off over in the background here. So it's coming in from the three different directions. The name Rockton Y only started to be used four, after, four years after this arrangement went in here. So it kind of gave birth to that whole terminology for that area and it stuck long after the trolley lines had disappeared. Now, the, the Beltline had to cross the Amsterdam Chuck and the Northern Railroad, which is shown in green here, up by what used to be Kelly Lumber, just off Edward Street. And in order to do that, they had to have a special setup here. They could cross the ground level. And they used to have to stop the trolley car, the motor room used to have to get out, and the conductor used to have to get out and check and make sure and flag the trolley through and everything to avoid any collisions at this point. To my knowledge, they never had an accident there. But it was a very unusual setup, and the Public Service Commission definitely didn't like the fact that they crossed the ground level. It took them a long time to get approval for that. That's one of the reasons it made so many twists and turns going through this area, it was in order to only have to cross the, the railroad road. Eventually, they got rid of the lower part of Roman Avenue here and we went to Street and Caleb Lark just to eliminate that really steep part at the bottom because people just didn't like the idea of coming down there and looking all of what they considered to be straight down into Main Street, especially if you had to make a 90 degree turn at the bottom. So let's say open the belt line in 1910, that's when Amsterdam's system was at its largest and it never got any bigger than that. They had planned to extend to the south side they had already shot down the extension to the northern areas. But the, it's interesting that the extension to the south side, the south side never, got, never got built because they thought that was a sure thing. They actually installed tracks in the river bridge when it was built in 1916 to reach the south side. It was part of an agreement that they had with the city that said, we want to double track Main Street. And they said, okay, but you can't double track Main Street unless you agree to two things. Number one, we want you to 
sprinkle the streets more because the dust is just terrible. A lot of the streets weren't paved yet. So the railroad said, okay, we'll, we'll sprinkle the streets. Personally, I wouldn't want to be the guy riding on top of the sprinkler car, which was basically a tank of water that was spraying water in both directions and pulling 600 volts of DC electricity off the wire. <laughs> <line. laughs> That's quite a picture of the old bridge. Yeah. And uh, second, we want you to extend the service to the south side. So when they built the 19th, and the railroad agreed. So when they built the bridge in 1916, these rails were actually welded into the substructure of the, of the bridge and paved over until they could be connected. Well, they were never connected and they were never used and they never saw the light of day again until 1873 when the bridge was scrapped. But in 1913, Chalmers built a new mill on the south side and they were looking forward and they were really going ho, we're going to have trolley service to our new mill. So when they put illustrations of the mill out, and when they did their letterhead, they were all set. We're going to have trolley service. <laughs> and it showed up on their letterhead, and it showed up in illustrations and magazines showing the trolley service running by the Chalmers Mill on the south side. But it never got there. Okay, now we come to, now we come to the bad part of the story here. But in the mid-twenties, the automobile was becoming more and more popular. There had been changes in the laws governing the operation of bus lines that said trolley companies can also own bus lines. Up to that point, they hadn't been able to. And the costs of running this fixed infrastructure with all the wires and the poles and the tracks in the ground and the big expensive cars and all the crews and everything to support them, it was getting really expensive. And we were electrifying things about 1890 and now we're up into the 20s and it's 30 years old and all your equipment is 30 years, starting to get to be 30 years old now and things are wearing out and your electric generating equipment is 30 years old and things are getting to the point where you've got to start replacing <coughs> and your business is falling off and your equipment's getting old and your replacement costs are going up and uh, things aren't looking as good as they were 20 years ago. So the end of the year is starting to catch up with it. So first thing to go, City of Amsterdam says Okay, your uh, franchise says that you're responsible for paving between your rails and five feet on each side of them. And you were going home on putting in that uh, belt line. Well, we're going to pave all those streets now up there in that area. So, cough up for all the track you put in those streets up there for all that paving. And the FGNG says, uh, Public Service Commission, we'd like to abandon that belt line because uh, we don't, we're not making any money off of it and uh, it's going to cost us a fortune. And the uh, Public Service Commission took a look at it and said, uh, you know, you're probably right. So they approved the abandonment and in 28, the belt line was replaced with bus service. And shortly thereafter, shortly thereafter, a few years later, buses start replacing the Hangman line too in 36. So now we've now we've gotten to the point where we're really getting down on the cutting back the system. Oops. Between 1923 and 1933, ridership dropped by 68%. It went from 101 yeah, 1, 1, 1,500,000 riders to 480,000 riders. They were pretty much con 
pretty much accepting the fact that city ridership and local ridership of the trolley lines was done. I mean, passengers, city passengers, cars and buses are taken over. But the last chance they got maybe is to save the inner urbans. Maybe between cities we can still make money on this on this system. One of the advantages is we can outrun the buses. We can run cheaper than the buses, we can run faster than the buses. So in 33, the FJ and G goes out and they buy five state-of-the-art high-speed aluminum streamliner coaches from the Brill Company in Pennsylvania for $20,000 a piece. They can make the run from Clarksville to Schenectady in an hour, whereas the run by bus is an hour and a half with all the stops. So immediately we can cut a third of that off. So we got an advantage there. And it's starting to look a little better for them. They're getting, they're getting some business. But we gotta, we got to look at something where fate is going to come and kind of bite them. The FG&G Interurban Service, as I mentioned before, got into Schenectady from Scotia by using the Schenectady Railway Company tracks. They had a rental agreement with them. And they had, they had a good working relationship with them. They used to exchange cars and help each other out. But they used the Mohawk River Bridge that belonged to the Schenectady Railway Company. And then they'd take their trackage in through Washington Street and up State Street. And they'd loop around Veterans Park on State Street go up and go around and follow the tracks back out again. This is the bridge across the Mohawk that came out of Scotia. This is the Scotia end at the right end there. Uh, the bridge had been damaged by ice in 1928 and it was closed to auto and pedestrian traffic. They still have the trolleys in it. I'm not sure how that worked out. I would have thought, you know, they were closed to the trolleys and maybe let the cars use it. Because trolleys are a lot heavier, but still not. But Schenectady Railway isn't in any better shape financially than any other one. And they haven't been doing a lot of maintenance on this bridge for the last 10 years. So by 38, it's still been deteriorating for the last 10 years from the damage that occurred in 28. Public Service Commission in 38 condemns the bridge and says that's it. They're not using that bridge anymore for trolleys. It's not safe. So now you can't get your trolley into Schenectady anymore. Now you're stuck in Scotia. The loss of that bridge doing the FJ and G's efforts to revitalize the inner urban business because Schenectady Railway. They don't have the money to fix the bridge. FJ and G doesn't have any money to kick in to fix that bridge. So now in order to get people in and out of Schenectady, they got to bus them back and forth across the Western Gateway Bridge to Scotia, in and out of Schenectady, load them on the trolley there, and then bring them back and forth to Amsterdam. So that's very inconvenient for your passengers. It, it takes away your advantage of the time that you were saving by going on trolley because now you got to go part of the trip on bus and make a change. But the thing that really killed them is if you remember seeing that grill car, the grill car is a single-ended car. The old car is a double-ended. You can drive them from either end. The grill cars used to come in, go in, loop around the park, go back out again. That worked fine. Now there's no way to turn the grill car around anymore. Well, the Rockton Y, let's build a Y in Scotia. You can turn a car around at a Y. The FGNG doesn't even have the money to get the property and build a Y in Scotia and turn the cars around anymore. So they end up taking the grill cars that they just paid $20,000 a piece for a few years earlier. They take them back to the car barn in Coversville and they park them. They pull out the cars from 1903 that they had been using and they start running them on the line again. So now you've lost the advantage of the new, faster cars. You're back to the older cars, which aren't as nice, they're slower, and you're hauling people by bus on the last part of the trip. The writing was on the wall. In a few months, they petitioned the Public Service Commission to abandon all the electric service that they still provide in the valley. The Public Service Commission says, 
get everybody that you're servicing to agree that we can do the same thing with buses. They get the consent of all the communities that are involved. And as of June 29, 1938, they haul all service on the electric provision. On June 30th, their first buses roll out of the garages. They run buses until 1952. 1952, the SJG sells all their buses to the Mohawk Valley Transit Company and goes out of transportation business as far as passenger business associated with anything to do with trolleys. So trolleys are all done, right? Nothing left. They're all gone? Well, not really. Because if you look around, there's still a few pieces of things around. You've probably seen it a million times and not realize what it is you're looking at. The bottom of Henrietta Street on West Main is this big metal tower. It's got some wires attached to it now. But when the trolley system was operating, the high tension lines from the main plant up in Tribes Hill came down and attached to this tower. This is where they made a right angle turn and ran up to the substation up on the corner. There used to be a row of other smaller towers here up right until maybe 10 years ago. But this was the big heavy one because this one had to be well anchored because it made a 90 degree turn of the wires. So that had to resist a lot more stress and pull out. That's still there. You can still see the Volkswagen. You can still see the Volkswagen down there for now, yeah. The Amsterdam substation? Well, as of 2016, it's an empty lot. And before that, anybody ever buy a car from Miller Motors? This is the substation building here. Pretty modified. They may have put a flat roof on it, filled in the windows and everything. But that portion of it was the Amsterdam substation. Zombie tracks. Anybody ever drive up and down when we used to have a Main Street in Amsterdam before they put a mall in the middle of the city? <laughs> Anybody ever drive up and down and curse those tracks that kept coming back through the ground all the time? We didn't get rid of the tracks. No, nope. <laughs> and one of these days they're going to come through the floor of that building, I swear. This was until, until a few years ago when they repaved the section of Division Street. This was the entrance to where the car barn used to be. There was still sense of traction to see there. This was up on Quisby Avenue. This was up where the... Uh, Rockton Y used to be. This is still up at the top of Roman Avenue. Right now you can go up there and see these, see these big, long potholes. And if you want to drive down the Vision Street, just look for the long potholes, because if you look in the long potholes, you'll see a big rusty piece of rail at the bottom of the pothole. The Bun Creek Trestle. John, you asked if there's left at the Trestle? If you go to Harmon Field at the bottom of uh, Brookside Avenue, where Bun Creek comes out and crosses under Brookside, uh, there's concrete barriers there, but if you walk in and look up to either side, you'll see the concrete abutments that used to hold the stressor up there goes across. If you want to walk up Brookside a little ways on the sidewalk, and look back in, there's this flat area that runs back in to the top of that abutment. That's where the trolley tracks used to come out and attach to them, come out into the street. Sorry. <laughs> Up on Lion Street, across from where Crystal Bar used to be, it's the uh, Lion Street pub now. There's a memorial marker. If you look at the creek behind the memorial marker, you can see the remnants <coughs> of bridge abutments there. They were the abutments that held up this trolley bridge across the creek.
you go down to what's now Shuttleworth Park, you can take this road up the back, it'll take you up into the parking lot of Techno School. If you go over the guardrail right here where there's some paint on the guardrail and walk in just a little ways, you see a structure that looks like this. It looks like a very, very small bridge. This is what it used to look like when the trolley line went across there. It's a cattle pass. When they built the trolley line, they went through some private property back there which would have kept the cattle from being able to get to the grazing area. So they had to build a little pass for the cattle to get through the grazing area, the farmer's property. So that's a cattle pass. And if you go the other way, into Crescent Park, paralleling the road going down to the ball field, there's a raised area up here that's flattened. And it's a nice path you can walk. That's actually the road bed of the trolley line that you're walking along. If you get up at Hageman, down behind the cemetery, there's a house down here at the end of Park Street. That's the former pavilion for the truck that owned the park. It used to be located down in that area. A little farther up on Park Street is the maintenance garage in Hagen. There's a little rectangular building on the back of the maintenance garage that was built on to in the front. That was the car house in Hagen, or the trolley garage. If they ran the car up there on a late night run, they might want to leave it up there to use it in the morning, to make the morning run. That's where they put the trolley in for the night. This is the last bridge going in just before you get to the waiting room over here. Tom's Tavern again. Everybody knows where the taverns are. This abutment right here, that's still there in the middle of the creek. The lower Tribes Hill Station. The station's still there. As you're coming down Mohawk Drive, descending the hill just before you get to that sweeping curve. There's a spot where the road kind of flattens out. That's where the trolley tracks used to cross the road, that flat spot. You go down a little further, Iroquois Trail branches off on the right-hand side. There's a red house here. Behind the red house, there's a little red shed. Look familiar? Browers, just above Tribes Hill, all on Old Trail Road. If you drive out Old Trail Road, you get up to the old Browers Mansion. Big stone house, or a big brick house. It sits on the right-hand side of the road just before you make a sharp left-hand 90-degree corner. That's the Browers Mansion. Trolley line used to run behind their house down by the creek in what they called the Valai. They had their own station back there. Remember I said a lot of families, stations are named for them. If you, the brick house is over here, look across the street. There's a little building sitting across the street. It used to be the Brower Station. It's a tool shed now for the house across the street. Any cars still around? Well, yeah, kind of, if you really want to count those real cars that got repossessed. Number 127, one of the real cars. After they went back to uh, Brill, after they got repossessed, they got sold to Bamberger Electric out in Utah. They ran them between Salt Lake City and Ogden, Utah until 1952 in passenger service. It was an excellent, excellent application, straight and fast out there. In 1952, they took them out of service and sold them to the Utah Pickle Company. Utah Pickle Company used them for migrant labor housing. <laughs> yeah. Scrapped, scrapped the motors and the uh, trucks, the wheel sets, and used the bodies for housing. Somewhere along the line, for the migrants. Pardon? For the migrants. 
just, yeah, just, just, an just an interesting point. Most of, most of the trolleys and everything, from this, uh, when the line closed down, they scrapped everything. They towed the trolleys up outside of Broad Alban on the steam line, tipped them over on their sides, and burned them. Then they went back and they collected all the metal and scrapped that because that's the only thing that was worth anything at the time. Where is the Southern California Railway Museum? What's, this is in what Par city? Paris, California. Paris. P E R R I S, California. Somehow they got a hold of one of these, probably from the Utah Pickle Company, and uh, restored it. The interesting thing is that when Bamberger bought these, all they did was change the name on the stripe under the windows. They kept the same numbers on them, they kept the same paint scheme. So this is pretty faded out here, but it's been restored back to the paint colors of what Van Berger got them. And this is actually the FJ and G paint scheme and colors on the car, and the FJ and G number, 127. So it's, the F it's actually the FJ and G car with the exception of the name under the windows. But it is, it is restored and it is out at the, uh, out at the railway museum there. So if you wanted to see something that ran on the FJ&T system, you go out there and do it. When they restored it, did they, uh, did they add the trolleys and the motors back? They, they were able to, uh, yeah, the car is operational. So they, from somewhere they, they salvaged them from something else. The interesting thing about those cars, we only sold two orders of those cars. The five that they sold the FG and G and they sold 14 somewhere else. But those are the only type of that model they ever sold. Number 128, which is this one, as of 1994, became the front dining room of the Art City Trolley Restaurant. And that's in Springvale, Utah. Uh, I put that up on the internet, and they are currently renovating the restaurant. I hope they are keeping the trial. <laughs> Pretty fun. You know, you used to see a lot of diners in rail cars. Yes. Now, were, were, did they use tra trolley cars a lot or they? They did for the first ones, but eventually. One of the companies that built trolley cars went into the business of building diners oh, yeah. using the same <laughs> basic construction. Interesting. And that, folks, is the end of the line. <laughs> so thanks for coming to us. <laughs> and do you got any other questions? How long was the system total in place? I mean, I'm sorry? Or how long was the total system in place? From the, from the time they started up until the, they shut down the last, from the time the horse car started until the, the uh, 38 was the plug in 38 was 64 years. Gary? I, I heard that if you had a pocket of nickels, you could ride from Amsterdam to Chicago on a trolley. Can you collaborate that? At, at one point, I'll, I'll, qualify, I'll qualify that. At one point, you could ride from Boston to Chicago on trolley cars with the exception of 22 miles between Fonda and Little Falls. And the FJ and G had plans to close that gap when everything started to fall apart. I'm from San Francisco, and they still use the trolley cars. This thing is cable cars, right? Yeah, but we have a cable car then and, and trolley cars. Trolley cars too. So the F line is the trolley. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, New Orleans still has them, Memphis has them. There are several cities that still have trolleys. Boston. We ride up to this place. We ride up to this place. We try to find an excuse to make this thing ride up. The one in South Kansas. The one in San Francisco is kind of interesting because they run historic cars on it. Oh. And it's like a special sort of line. Kingston runs some cars too. Yeah. yeah. So it's strange that the uh, grill of those luxury cars only uh, could go in one direction. They didn't take 
couldn't tell. Well, they, they were built as single ended cars. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that must have been a, like a liability trying to sell them, I would think. Maybe that's why they only sold so few. Um, <laughs> Everybody had gotten everybody had gotten away from running more than one man cars at that. They had pretty much everybody had gone to using just one person per car. Okay, so that was a common thing. It yeah. wasn't, wasn't just those. Yeah. And uh, those cars would do seventy five miles an hour. Now. Oh. So I, I failed to mention that. But they were they were like they were like luxury upholstery on the inside, and 75 miles an hour. Everybody had their own individual seats. And they were like you know first class airline. Jerry, you, you said there was a spring that held the uh, the pulley onto the electric wire above. The the poles were spring loaded to keep them forced up. So you'd have to compress the spring to pull the pole down. So if you let go of the compression, the spring will push the pole up into the wire. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. What happened to that trolley car that Amsterdam had at church? I was afraid somebody was going to. Oh, yeah. Oh, it went on church. Because um, it's gone. Yeah, I know it's gone. The, the original agreement we had when it was out there it was that it would be moved indoors and we would have the space to work on. That agreement was changed unilaterally. And we were told that we had to get it out of there. It never would have been there in the first place. It would have been somewhere else. The cost, the cost to move it to another location was several thousand dollars. It's gone. No longer exists. <coughs> that was number 29. It's in one of the pictures. And it, it, let's just say it got to the point where it was not much good. It was a choice between sanity and doing something. Do you think if they hung on for a couple more years that... Oh, good, that point. <laughs> good point. Yes. If they had been able to hang on probably for another two or three years until World War II, they may very well have been able to make a go of it. Because had that happened with the war industry and, and Schenectady with General Electric and Alco, the demand for reasonable transport and uh, gas rationing and everything. I think they definitely, definitely hung on for another decade, at least possibly longer. There was that much of an increase, you think, in the uh, need for uh, people? I think I think there would have been just for transport you know, mm -hmm. to, to move workers from there. Oak Valley down down to that area. We can conjecture about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You save all that gas money, <laughs> and people, and you know we need to get there to get the work. Right, exactly. I mean, now now this, now everybody wants you know get an electric car. <laughs> That's a pretty good size electric car. You can hold a lot of people with it. It was 75 miles an hour down the mountain. Yeah, <laughs> if there was actually mass transportation, electric mass transportation. Exactly. And that's why I say, maybe, maybe, you know, in hindsight, maybe you shouldn't have gotten so, right. so right. eager to tear, tear it up and throw it away so fast. Well, that's it. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.